First Minister on the fiscal framework. We are now moving to the next item of business, which is a debate on motion number 15694 in the name of John Swinney on the Land and Buildings Transaction Tax Amendment Scotland Bill. Members who leave in the chamber should do so quickly and quietly, and those who want to take part in the debate should press the request to speak button now. And I'll give just a few seconds for the room to clear. I now call on John Swinney to speak to move the motion. Deputy First Minister, 10 minutes. Officer, I'm pleased to open the debate on the general principles of the Land and Buildings Transaction Tax Amendment Scotland Bill, which I introduced to Parliament on the 27th of January this year. I'd like to begin by thanking all those who gave evidence, written and oral, to the Finance Committee, and also those such as the Law Society of Scotland and Revenue Scotland, who have given and are continuing to give freely of their time to work collaboratively with the Bill team to resolve some of the more thorny technical matters and to ensure, as far as practical, a smooth implementation of this Bill. Uh, I am grateful to the Convener and members of the Finance Committee for their scrutiny of the Bill at Stage 1, and particularly for Committee members' cooperation in working to an expedited timetable for this Bill. Um, I welcome the Committee's support for the general principles of the Bill. In light of the expedited Bill timetable, I wrote yesterday to the Convener of the Finance Committee setting out the Scottish Government's response to the Committee's Stage 1 report on this Bill. And I hope it was helpful to members to have that response in advance of the debate today. The Land and Buildings Transaction Tax Amendment Scotland Bill introduces a 3% Land and Buildings Transaction Tax supplement payable on the purchase of additional dwellings such as buy-to-let or second homes. Subject to parliamentary approval, this means that from the 1st of April 2016, anyone buying a residential property in Scotland of £40,000 and above who already owns a residential property here or anywhere in the world will pay an additional 3% land and buildings transaction tax on the whole purchase price of the property unless they are simply replacing their existing main residence. The Scottish Government wishes to maximise the opportunities for first-time buyers to get a foot on the property ladder in Scotland. The Bill will counteract the potential distortive effect of a new stamp duty land tax higher rate of tax being brought in in the rest of the United Kingdom from the 1st of April 2016. Without a land and buildings transaction tax supplement, it is likely that the stamp duty land tax higher rate of tax would make it relatively more attractive for investors to buy up homes in Scotland, particularly at the lower end of the market, thus increasing the competition for first-time buyers and therefore the danger of undermining the policy objectives of the Scottish Government in this respect. So the motivation of the Government has been clearly expressed to deal with such, uh, circumstances that we believe are made more likely by the tax changes that are made in the rest of the United Kingdom. I am aware from the evidence presented to the Finance Committee during their Stage 1 scrutiny of the Bill that some stakeholders have expressed disappointment at the 3% supplement applying to the whole purchase price and view this as a return to a form of slab tax which prevailed in the former stamp duty land tax that existed in Scotland. As I have indicated already, the Scottish Government wishes to do all that it can to empower first-time buyers to purchase their first home. The rationale for applying the supplement to the whole purchase price is that it will, improve, it will impose a greater tax charge on purchases of additional property at lower value transactions. This is where the demand for properties for investment purchases or holiday homes could make it difficult for first-time buyers to enter the market to purchase a main residence. For example, someone buying a property as their main residence for £100,000 will not pay any land and buildings transaction tax, but someone buying the same property for an investment or a second home will pay £3,000. As I indicated in my draft budget statement last uh, December, the supplement is estimated to raise between £17 million and £29 million in 2016-17 after taking account of behavioural effects, including any impact on underlying LBTT revenues. The Scottish Fiscal Commission has endorsed the estimate as reasonable, recognising the uncertainties posed by the lack of Scottish data on these type of transactions. And in estimating the revenues, and I discussed these issues with the Finance Committee in our earlier 
discussions on this point. The government has erred on the side of caution in, un in, in estimating the volume of revenues that could arise from the tax change that is being made, given the fact that there could be um, behavioural implications of the, uh, the, the application of this particular tax charge. Uh, the Scottish Government considers the housing system should cater for a variety of needs and demands across all tenures. I certainly recognise the need to balance support for home ownership and first-time buyers without discouraging significant and beneficial investment in residential property for rent. The Scottish Government has been supporting the purpose-built private rented sector since 2013, funding both the Building the Rented Sector study and a dedicated private rented sector champion tasked with ensuring action is taken to boost the supply of high-quality private rented sector homes at scale. After reviewing and reflecting on the Stage 1 evidence, I am pleased to say the Scottish Government concurs with the Finance Committee Stage 1 report recommendation that provision should be made within the Bill for a relief from Land and Buildings Transaction Tax Supplement for buyers purchasing six or more residential properties in one transaction. The Scottish Government intends to bring forward a Stage 2 amendment to give effect to this particular issue. On the issue of reliefs in general, I note from reviewing the Stage 1 evidence that there are suggestions for a variety of reliefs from the supplement. The Scottish Government recognises that the housing market changes over time and where practical and affordable wishes to do what it can to create sound, sustainable market conditions. However, as with the land and buildings transaction tax system, I am firmly of the view that a period of time will be required to enable the land and buildings transaction tax supplement to become embedded and for sufficient financial and statistical data to be collected to enable informed policy decisions to be made in the future. The position on reliefs with particular reference to the Land and Buildings Transaction Tax Supplement will be kept under review as part of the ongoing process of devolved tax planning and management. But I hope that the specific relief that I have set out in relation to the purchase of the bulk purchase of properties it gives some further clarity to the marketplace and can enable commitments to be made with the assurance that I have given. When I gave oral evidence before the Finance Committee, I did not close the door on implementing a grace period for transactions. I have carefully reviewed the Stage 1 evidence and have considered further helpful input from both the Law Society of Scotland and Revenue Scotland. I am not convinced of the strength of that evidence as yet, but I do not want to entirely close the door on implementing a grace period. The approach that I have elected to take here is to ask Revenue Scotland to monitor the position between the LBTT supplement provisions coming into force and the 30th of October 2016. The data collected will enable the Scottish Government to take an informed view as to the need or otherwise of a grace period and what a grace period should be. There are, of course, existing provisions within the legislation which um, enable um, individuals to essentially um, claw back uh, charges that may have been applied um, over an 18-month period. And I hope that provides sufficient reassurance to Parliament. But I, I reiterate the point that I uh, remain <coughs> open to considering these points in due course. I am aware that a number of stakeholders have called for an early and comprehensive review of the impact of the supplement. I welcome the Finance Committee's comments in their Stage 1 report that developing an understanding of the impact of the supplement will be complex and take time, a view with which I concur. I consider that reviewing the impact of the supplement will require at least one complete year of data, given the seasonality in housing transactions, the likely forestalling behaviours and the longer-term trends in the housing market. The Scottish Government intends to update Parliament on the outcome of that review in the 2018-19 draft budget in accordance with our undertaking in the written agreement on the budget process to provide a commentary on outturn figures for the devolved taxes for the most recent year, including any variance between outturn and forecast. As currently drafted, the Bill proposes that the supplement does not apply to the purchase of a residential property where missives have been concluded between the, before the 16th of December 2015, the date of the Scottish uh, draft budget statement, even when the transaction 
did not settle until after the 1st of April 2016. When the missive, where the missives for the transaction have been concluded on or after the 16th of December 2015, the supplement has been proposed to apply if this transaction settles on or after the 1st of April 2016. The Scottish Government has listened carefully to the stakeholder community and intends to bring forward an amendment at stage two, whereby the supplement will not apply to the purchase of a residential property where missives have been concluded before the 28th of January 2016, but this transaction does not settle until on or after the 1st of April 2016. I believe this adjustment delivers a fairer result for buyers who may have been putting in offers for property or making reserv reservations for new build property in the period before the detail of the proposed supplement was in the public domain when the bill and the accompanying documents were published on the Scottish Parliament's website. Now, with these comments, Presiding Officer, I move that Parliament agrees to the general principles of the Land and Buildings Transaction Tax Amendment Scotland Bill. Thank you. I now call on Kenneth Gibson to speak on behalf of the Finance Committee. Seven minutes. Yeah, thank you, Presiding Officer. And it is with pleasure that I speak on behalf of the Finance Committee in this Stage 1 debate on the Land and Buildings Transaction Tax Amendment Scotland Bill. I'd like to thank Finance Committee members, uh, the clerks and those who gave evidence to help us reach our deliberations expeditiously, along with our advisor, Professor McEwen, who produced an excellent summary of the responses whilst working to a particularly tight deadline. Following publication of the UK Autumn Statement, in which the Chancellor set out plans to introduce a 3% stamp duty land tax supplement on the purchase of additional homes from 1st of April, the Scottish Government set out similar proposals in its draft budget. The Government has emphasised the need to introduce a supplement at the same time as it comes into force in England and Wales to mitigate the risk of any related impact on the Scottish property market. And this meant the usual consultation process could not be undertaken and standing orders were suspended to facilitate a truncated timetable for parliamentary consideration of the Bill. Whilst the Committee notes that these circumstances were far from ideal, we recognise the reasons behind them and accept there must be an element of flexibility in the scrutiny arrangements. In essence, there is a need to balance the risk of not responding immediately to UK tax changes with the risk of unintended consequences from enacting legislation without first conducting full consultation and comprehensive parliamentary scrutiny. The need to achieve such a balance is clearly an issue of real importance to Scotland's public finances and one which may arise more frequently in the future. We intend to reflect carefully on this before setting out recommendations on how best to balance these competing priorities in our legacy report. We issued our own, albeit shorter than usual, consultation exercise and received over 50 responses ranging from professional bodies to individuals concerned about the Bill's potential impact on their own property dealings. We then took evidence from a range of stakeholders before hearing from the Deputy First Minister. Turning to the Bill's policy objectives, the key intention is to ameliorate any potential market distortions arising from the proposed UK supplement which would impact in particular on first-time buyers. Concerns were raised by some stakeholders that no impact assessment had been undertaken and there was a lack of data on the Scottish second home and buy-to-let markets. We therefore recommend that the Government commissions research and take steps to improve the level of data available in these areas. Ministers should closely monitor the supplement's impact on the housing market and conduct a comprehensive review once sufficient information is available. Now, following on from this, we also recommend that the Scottish Fiscal Commission should provide a commentary in the first six months of the supplement's operation, including the impact of forestalling by the end of November. And I note that today the Deputy First Minister uh, is suggesting that one full year's data would be more appropriate, and that's something we'll deliberate on. We had mixed views on the policy's likely impact on first-time buyers, with concerns expressed that the supplement would act as a deterrent to investment in new housing developments. Others suggested that with a supplement not introduced, investors from outside Scotland could push up property prices. Whilst recognising the Government's policy intentions regarding first-time buyers, the Committee was also conscious of the need to protect housing supply for those who rent their homes either through choice or necessity. We heard that the vast majority of landlords own fewer than five homes, with large numbers owning just a single buy-to-let property. Concerns were raised that not only could the supplement deter investment in housing, it may simply result in additional costs being passed on to tenants via higher rents. Again, we consider it essential that the Government closely monitors the supplement's impact on rent levels, particularly in areas where rents are already high. To mitigate the, the possible deterrent effect on investment in Scotland's housing stock, numerous reliefs were suggested by stakeholders. 
Unfortunately, it was not possible for us to scrutinise every proposal in the time available, and you remain conscious that exemptions and release have the potential to provide loopholes and opportunities for tax avoidance. We therefore invite the Government to comment on the stakeholders' suggestions. The Committee was convinced of the case for introducing certain specific reliefs for registered social landlords, local authorities and student halls of residence. Not only is the availability of quality, affordable housing for those on lower incomes a key challenge facing Scotland, we also heard that many local authorities and registered social landlords have engaged in significant house purchase activity. This has helped support the construction industry during the period of recent market recovery. In respect of student halls of residence, it is clear that they are designed such that they are unsuitable for anyone seeking to buy a home. We therefore recommend that relief should be introduced for both types of properties, and that should mirror those reliefs provided for in the original LBTT Act. Another proposed relief which we support is for larger scale investors purchasing six properties or more. This was suggested by numerous professional bodies and is consistent with the provisions of the original LBTT Act, which states that where six or more dwellings are the subject of a single transaction, then they are treated the same as non-residential property for tax purposes. The UK Government consultation seeks views on release for bulk property purchases, and we are mindful that the provision of such relief south of the border, but not here, could adversely affect investment in the Scottish market. Furthermore, we consider it unlikely that such a relief would cover small-scale investors who are more likely to be in direct competition with first-time buyers to purchase existing properties. Nevertheless, we remain mindful that this relief may need to be reviewed if there are signs of a negative impact on the number of new housing developments due to a decrease in the number of buy-to-let properties being purchased by smaller investors. We are also clear that a grace period should be provided to cover unintended circumstances where a purchaser may temporarily own two properties simultaneously as a result of a sale being delayed or falling through. I am pleased the Government has confirmed its intention to amend the Bill to introduce these reliefs and look forward to discussing them further with the Deputy First Minister in next week's Stage 2 proceedings. Presiding officer, in conclusion, the Committee supports the general principles of the Bill, but remains conscious that whilst the proposed supplement may appear relatively straightforward, a number of potentially complex issues remain which will require careful consideration at stages two and three. In particular, there is a need to ensure that appropriate reliefs are introduced which balance the needs of first-time buyers with those who rent their home and with interests of house builders and investors. This will not be easy, especially given the lack of sufficient data on the current structure of the housing market in Scotland. It is therefore essential that the impact of this bill is closely monitored and a comprehensive review carried out once sufficient data is available. I look forward to considering these important issues further at stage two and hearing the contributions of other members to this debate. Thank you, Mr Gibson. I now call on Jackie Bailey. Ms Bailey, seven minutes. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And I welcome much of what the Cabinet Secretary had to say in his speech and his recognition of the Finance Committee's recommendations and the concerns expressed by stakeholders. I think it is important just to take a step back, though, and consider the context, because land and building transaction tax was levied for the first time last year. And when the Cabinet Secretary set out his quite comprehensive plans for the tax, well over a year ago now, um, it was a matter of a couple of months before he had to think again and bring new proposals back to the Parliament to respond to George Osborne's proposals for stamp duty land tax. Now, whilst I would observe it was probably the fastest change of policy in history, I do understand the Cabinet Secretary's desire to have a similar fiscal position in Scotland as it is with the rest of the UK. But now we're presented with the Land and Building Transaction Tax Supplement, and yes, it was indeed the self-same Chancellor, George Osborne, that introduced this in his autumn statement. A new 3% supplement for stamp duty land tax, and the Cabinet Secretary moved quickly to copy this. So now we have a Land and Buildings Transaction Tax Supplement on purchases of additional residential properties at 3% for those transactions over £40,000. And I know and accept there are very strong arguments for us to have the same fiscal regime north and south of the border. Our housing markets are incredibly similar. They can and will be influenced by each other. But there are times we might choose to do things differently. There are obviously times when we want to respond very quickly so that behavioural responses to tax changes are minimised. That has implications for consultation with stakeholders. It has implications for scrutiny by this parliament. 
And I know it hasn't been an entirely satisfactory process for stakeholders, or indeed for members of the Finance Committee, because of the speed at which things have been done. And I do hope that the Government and the Finance Committee will consider this in the future so we get the balance right. And I think that's something we want to return to, because I can see circumstances in the future um, of this happening time and time again. And I don't think any of us want to see a situation where speed means bad legislation with unintended consequences. In that context, let me draw members' attention to the House of Commons Treasury Committee report, not something I read often, but it's now going on my list, because I think it's fair to say they're not enamoured at all with the stamp duty land tax supplement. There's a very strong suggestion coming from them there should be no rush to implementation because of the complexity and because of the possibility of unintended consequences. They also feel it would actually be detrimental to the buy-to-let property market and recognise the importance of this sector for labour mobility. And I want to return to that point in a minute. Now, I'm not sure, and I don't know whether the Deputy First Minister is any clearer than I am, if there is any possibility that George Osborne might delay implementation or indeed substantially change the proposal. But for me, that raises really interesting questions. Now, given that the Scottish Government have aligned themselves with the proposal from the UK Government, does this mean that the introduction will be delayed in Scotland if it is delayed in the rest of the UK? Or does the Deputy First Minister intend to proceed regardless? And perhaps it provides us an opportunity to think this through, but in any event, we do need stability and certainty and not chop and change. So there are real issues that I know will be grappled with by the government. But we will decide on the Scottish budget for 2016-17 tomorrow. Assumptions have been made about the revenue that we will be generated by this supplement. We'll have no idea, though, what the posture of the UK government is going to be to the Treasury Committee report until at least mid-March, is my understanding. Now, notwithstanding, indeed, I thank the member for giving way. I mean, I just wonder if she would accept that this is a good method to protect local people uh, from second-hand, second-home owners. Jackie Beale. I do, and if you were unclear about that, let me apologise to the member. Um, I do absolutely accept that, but there are unintended consequences that we should be alive to um, and not simply just, you know, look narrowly at the principle and nothing else. So there are wider questions. There are issues that need to be addressed in the legislation before us. Areas for exemption that the Scottish Government has said it will think about further and come back to the committee at stages two and three. And let me consider just a couple of those areas. There are many more. The committee spelt those out in pages and pages of possible reliefs. Now, the Scottish Government has a laudable intention of attracting new skilled workers to Scotland. Will any such person who is perhaps a homeowner abroad and who wants to buy a home here be liable for the additional 3%. If that's the case, I don't think that sends out the message you want that we would welcome those with skills that we need to this country. How will ownership abroad be identified and that additional tax be enforced? Alternatively, Scots who aspire to maybe have a second home abroad, um, will they be liable for 3% of the purchase price? Now, I think the answer is yes. I think it could well be unpopular. Um, however, how would you check it? How would you enforce it? So it's the practical implementation. That woman's name remains on the ownership of the house she leaves. Will she be liable for the additional 3%? If a person who is a homeowner purchases a half stake in a flat valued at £75,000, do they become liable for 3% of £75,000, 3% of £37,500, or not liable at all? Now, I don't do that to say this is a pro I do that to suggest there is a complexity here um, that we need to understand, and in a short period of time, um, I wonder whether we wouldn't arrive at unintended consequences. And finally, presiding officer, let me turn to the revenue that it's likely to raise. Um, I think it's fair to say that the amount raised with residential LBTT is less than expected. Um, we have nine months of outturn data so far, but the modelling of behavioural impacts is critical. LBTT supplement has benefited from more assessment, 
but the Scottish Government keep telling us there is limited availability of data. We clearly need more. We, know, we want to know how you're doing your forecasting methodology. But the yield was anticipated at 45 million to 70 million. It's been revised down quite dramatically to 17 million and 29 million. If this is simply a tax to generate more income, then it is a very inefficient way of doing it. Presiding officer, maybe the House of Commons Treasury Committee might have got this right and we should proceed with less haste. But I do recognise the dilemma for the Scottish Government, so we will support the general principles of the Bill at decision time. Thank you. I now call on Gavin Brown. Five minutes, Mr Brown. Uh, presiding officer, thank you. Um, it certainly appears uh, clearly to me that uh, both north and south of the border that this measure is far more complex than first appeared when it was announced in the autumn statement. And I have the voice of former Minister Jim Mather ringing in my ears as I have reviewed this uh, piece of legislation. Mr Mather once said to me, Gavin, there is no such thing as unintended consequences. There is only lazy thinking. Um, and that had an impact on me then and has done uh, since uh, that particular time. Uh, presenting officer, I think, though, ultimately, having thought carefully about the piece of legislation, it is my view that the risk of inaction is greater than the risk of unintended consequences flowing from legislative action. And so on that basis, I uh, was prepared to support it at the committee stage, and we will be voting in favour of the principles of the legislation come decision time today. That said, presenting officer, there are clearly significant issues to resolve, and I think the government uh, would accept that. But I would say in passing, if the UK government were to decide to delay the legislation south of the border, and I have no uh, inside information on that, but if they were to do so, I do think we should give serious consideration to doing so as well. And Mr Swinney would certainly face no criticism uh, from this part of the chamber um, were that to be the case. But I assume uh, that it's going to uh, pass south of the border in the current timescale, and therefore my working assumption is that it will be the same here. Um, there are risks presenting. Officer Kenneth Gibson, I think, captured one of them quite neatly, in that in trying to help first-time buyers, we have to be very, very sure that we don't actually end up making them worse off if we see a reduction in development. One of the arguments put forward to the committee was this, that um, a number of developments that go ahead rely on what are called off-plan sales. So these are pre-sales made in advance of the development uh, being built, but it is much more likely that anyone involved in a pre-sale is a buy-to-let operator or a second homeowner as opposed to somebody going for their first mortgage. Some of these developments rely on pre-sales in order to secure funding, and if some of these developments don't go ahead, then there could be a greater uh, danger of lack of supply than we currently have. And I think as much analysis as can be done on that ought to be done. Did I hear someone once? Yeah, of course, uh, I'll give way to, to Mr MacDonald. Great, grateful to Gavin Brown for giving way. He would, he would of course, accept, though, that at the committee, um, I asked for empirical evidence to support that supposition, and none was forthcoming. So while the, the suggestion was made, there is currently no data, at least none that was made available to the committee, that would back it up. Gavin Brown. I, I mean, except Mr McDonald makes a, makes a fair point. There wasn't empirical evidence. There was uh, evidence from a number of witnesses. Uh, there is anecdotal evidence. And I suppose that's one of the reasons why uh, all of us on the committee certainly took the view that the government needs to do, uh, should actually commission specific research into the issue of the impact of first, uh, buy to let and second homes on the property market as a whole. And while the government um, so far don't seem minded to uh, take that forward, uh, specifically, I would encourage them to do so um, as they work through this piece of legislation. Presenting officer, I think one of the issues, uh, first, I welcome a number of comments the, first, the Deputy First Minister made, uh, particularly in relation to um, local authorities and RSLs, particularly in relation to large scale investors, and particularly in relation to changes to the transitional period, all of which I think are sensible and fair. I want to uh, in my remarks or in the final minute or so that I have and, and perhaps in closing is to focus very strongly on the concept of the accidental uh, second homeowner. The Deputy First Minister isn't minded to make changes at this stage but said that the uh, door is not entirely closed which I uh, take with uh, great uh, satisfaction and will push hard against that door to ensure that it reopens because I think this stuck out like a sore thumb to me uh, presenting officer the objective of the legislation quite specifically is not to capture 
those who are simply replacing their existing main residence. But it's obvious to me that there is a severe risk that we capture a significant number of people in that category. Because if you have a family, the family has grown perhaps, and they simply want to move uh, to a bigger house to accommodate that, if they purchase that new house first, and then the sale doesn't happen of their existing home on the same day, whether it falls through or simply takes longer for it to happen, not only do they have to uh, get some form of bridging loan, but they would be immediately liable for this 3% surcharge, which could amount to thousands upon thousands of pounds, even for those who are currently out of LBTT entirely for purchases um, below the threshold there. So I think that's a severe risk. I, my time for now is up, presenting officer. I'll, I'll return to this because I think it is a, the biggest significant weakness and one that I uh, genuinely want to work with the government on to get it right at stage two. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Brown. You will have an opportunity in about four minutes' time. Um, I, now call, I now call Mark MacDonald. You've got four minutes, but you could maybe push it to five. Oh, gosh. Oh, gosh. The, 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 the pressure now, presiding officer, to give Gavin Brown time to collect his thoughts for his, his summing up speech and perhaps give him some content for it as well. Who knows? Um, I think there are a few things that, that, that need to be highlighted. And um, I, I, I think the, the committee uh, took a great deal of evidence in a very short space of time. And I think that um, it was very interesting, some of the evidence that we did receive. Um, <clears throat> Jackie Bailey spoke about um, if this was just a bill designed to generate more revenue. I think, it, I think that belies the fact that the, the, the genesis of this bill was firstly to ensure that there wasn't a, a detrimental impact as a consequence of a, a policy change taking place at a UK level, um, and secondly, uh, to ensure protection for first-time buyers against buy-to-let uh, investment. Um, I think one of the things that, that I... Pointed, well, I pointed out in an intervention to Gavin Brown, and I think I became um, slightly frustrated by during the course of the evidence taking, was that an awful lot of certainty was being drawn from supposition and anecdotal evidence when there didn't seem to be a lot of hard data and empirical evidence backing it up. Um, and that made it, I think, very difficult for the committee to reach a true value judgment on some of the issues that were being raised with us by some of the witnesses who came before the committee. And that's why I think, as Gavin Brown says, I think the, the notion of getting some more data uh, that, that can really be the bedrock for, for analysis uh, of impacts on the housing market is absolutely uh, critical and important. And I think uh, as this policy rolls out alongside um, LBTT itself over a period of time, uh, once you have the opportunity to essentially bottom out for stalling effects uh, and other variations, um, I think that will then give us an, a, a better idea uh, of impact uh, and perhaps help us to build a, a slightly better picture of what is happening in relation to the housing market. In terms of reliefs, I think that um, the committee report, and, and we had some discussion around how we, how we lay it out, but the committee report does go into some great detail about the range of reliefs that have been suggested from various quarters. And I think that um, there are a number of risks inherent with, with any system of relief that is brought in that it runs the risk of creating significant loopholes which could then undermine the policy intention of the legislation. So um, I think the committee has uh, very properly uh, asked the Scottish Government for its view on the basket of reliefs, but at the same time has focused on a couple of specific reliefs that it feels uh, are necessary. And I think the, the Deputy First Minister has responded uh, very fairly to those suggestions. The third issue that I've sort of wrestled with and looked at is, um, and I, I mentioned it in uh, the evidence taking at committee, is around the, the flexibility that the current process that we go through in Parliament affords to the Scottish Government. It doesn't necessarily relate specifically to this piece of legislation, but I think in general terms, if we look at the flexibility that is afforded to the Scottish Government in terms of reacting to tax change uh, or announcing tax changes versus that which is afforded to the Chancellor, who can stand up at the dispatch box and announce a change that will take effect at midnight that evening, should he so choose to do so, versus the Scottish Government, which, under the processes that are agreed through Parliament, has to essentially signal its intentions some months in advance of changes taking place and the opportunity that that process allows for behavioural change and for stalling to take place 
versus that which exists at Westminster, I think is something that does need to be explored in more detail in future, um, perhaps by a successor committee uh, for, for, from the Finance Committee. But also, I think it would be welcome in the next Parliament, I think, to get some more thinking from the Scottish Government around that as well. Um, I think that the, um, the, the main thrust of this, I think, um, is first and foremost that first-time buyers uh, have to be protected in terms of the purchases that they make. And I see that despite being told I could push it to five minutes, I'm now being told to hurry up, so I will, I will do so, presiding officer. But one of the things I noted uh, in terms of the intentions of LBTT when it was first introduced was to stimulate purchase at the lower end of the market. And uh, anecdotally from, from estate agents locally in my constituency, we are seeing uh, a stimulation of the market at the lower end, which was the intention. So um, I, I'm confident that that is happening, but I think this is necessary a necessary measure to ensure that that is protected. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you, Mr Macdonald. You actually got four minutes, 45 seconds, so you did quite well. Um, now we'll go to the wind-up speeches. Gavin Brown, four minutes. Thank you. Well, it's been a fairly short debate, Presiding Officer, I have to say. Um, I do want to return to the, the issue of the, the accidental uh, second homeowner, because I genuinely uh, think this could be a pretty big problem and one which I think both south of the border and here uh, hasn't been considered anywhere uh, near enough. Because we deliberately want to exclude those, as we heard in the uh, policy memorandum, those who are just replacing uh, their existing main residence. Um, so therefore, people, families selling their house and the sale doesn't go through, uh, it can fall for any reason, um, it could just take longer to sell than they anticipated. In both of those scenarios, they of course would be liable to pay that sum of money uh, ranging uh, from a few hundred to potentially tens of thousands of pounds uh, in some cases, money which of course could be clawed back ultimately, but money which would have to be paid up front in the first instance. This in my view is wrong uh, for a number of reasons. Firstly, it does just seem to me unduly punitive. Not only are people in that scenario likely to then need some form of uh, emergency finance or bridging loan, but at the same time, we add to their stress with this instant bill that has to be paid before the transaction uh, can go ahead. In many cases, that might just take them to the financial brink. It might result in a transaction then not going ahead, which could have implications elsewhere in that housing chain, because very few transactions take place in a vacuum, unless it's just the first time buyer involved. There are quite often uh, chains, as they're called, or a number of transactions relying upon another transaction taking place. And if one of those falls, because this uh, tax having to be paid up front it takes them over the financial burden, then I think it could have a wider impact on the housing market as a whole. It strikes me as unduly bureaucratic, presiding officer, particularly again when the government's stated intention is not to bring these people within the realms of the legislation. And I, I suppose also that I just feel there could be a wider deterrent on the market as a whole. Many of us, uh, many of our constituents out there are cautious. And you could end up in a scenario where people, just as a matter of uh, fact now, only buy once they have sold. We could end up with a market where people sell their house first and only after they have sold do they consider buying so that they make absolutely sure they're not liable uh, for these thousands of pounds. In some cases, that may be the right decision. But if that were to be the effect on the marketplace as a whole, then I think it could well have a detrimental effect on the economy. It could slow down parts of the housing market in a way that we don't want to. And I think if we allow that to go on uh, for six months, it may take some time to right the market at some point. And I think we're better uh, to look at it more carefully now. Of course, Revenue Scotland may uh, prefer the option that uh, Mr Swinney has suggested. It makes it uh, cleaner and simpler for them. But I urge him uh, in his closing speech, at least to say he will speak to more of the legal profession in particular, and to those who represent consumers and house buyers to get as much data as he possibly can before taking a final view on this, because I'm convinced that if he does so, he'll hear more strongly uh, from a number of them that something needs to be done. We heard on the committee that uh, a grace period would be one option. I certainly think that's one way of doing it, though I would say the uh, suggestion of 30-day grace period I don't think goes anywhere near far enough, because if a housing sale does fall through, it's pretty unlikely not impossible, but pretty unlikely that the average house sale will then happen in 30 days. Depending upon which website you look at, it could take eight weeks to 12 weeks on average to sell a house. And therefore, a lot of people 
again would be captured if the grace period were to 30 days. So I urge the uh, Deputy First Minister to give serious consideration to this. He has said he's not close to the idea. Um, I personally uh, would commit to working with him to try and find a solution to this because I genuinely believe uh, our constituents going forward, I wouldn't have any constituents post April presiding officer, but I genuinely believe uh, a number of constituents uh, going forward would see this as a huge matter of regret and we would then have to take uh, emergency action to deal with it and therefore I urge him to uh, indicate he would be willing to, to discuss in his closing. Thank you. Thank you Mr Brown. I'll not have any either come me. Um, now call on Liza Brennan. Ms Brennan, six minutes. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, just to sum up for the, the Labour group, I think it's obviously it's been a very short debate today, but we, we have heard uh, the, the key points. Um, so during the Finance Committee's evidence gathering session, we heard from members about the stated aims of the policy to minimise market distortion in Scotland due to the inward investment from the rest of the UK if the Tories introduce this initiative. And the Scottish Government considers this inver, um, inward investment could crowd out first-time buyers. I do support and we support the principles underpin, underpinning this tax to reduce rent-seeking behaviour, whether it's crowded out first-time buyers from uh, buy-to-let landlords or others for second-time homeowners. The draft budget estimates that this additional dwelling supplement would raise about £23 million in the first year. This sum actually equals the shortfall of Dundee City Council. So if, if you want to earmark it for Dundee City Council, I'd be really uh, happy with that. But seriously, the Charter Institute of Housing suggested uh, using the revenue and earmarking it for housing. And, and I would consider, uh, I would suggest that the Scottish Government ought to consider uh, that. Because I, I read in the, the Cabinet Secretary's response about how you are trying to promote uh, home ownership and you have got initiatives. But actually, if you do put the 23 million or the, the money uh, raised, it just would obviously help more people to get into the uh, housing. I do have some concerns over the bill. I think, as everybody said, it is about the lack of credible data. It's, it was largely anecdotal data. Uh, and, I, and I did mention at the time about how me and colleagues were involved in the Scottish Government report baseline in the private rent sector in 2009 and one of the recommendations there was actually about improving the data and I do see actually that there's been very small improvements but I think to understand how the market works you need to understand what the motivations are for um, people owning more than one home and, and actually renting so whether it is the accidental landlords uh, or whether it's people who have inherited property we just need to understand how the, the private rent sector is evolving the proportion of households in the private rent sector has obviously increased since from 5% in 1999 to 14% now. And obviously this expansion was, it has been encouraged uh, by the Scottish Government. When you look at the, the rent increases at the Scotland level over the last year, it's, it's saying 1.6% in the private rent sector. So maybe, so maybe actually one of, one of the reasons um, if, if we are concerned about market distortions, a rental year, a rental year that was seeing 1.6% increase, it may not be as, as competitive as, as what some of they are down, down south. The registers of Scotland noted that approximately one in five purchases with a mortgage in Scotland were to first time buyers between 2005 and 2015. But I think it's important to be mindful of the context. House price annual inflation was 5.6% in England, 0.8% in Wales, 2.9% in Northern Ireland, and minus 9% in Scotland. And that's the latest data from ONS. So the price of properties for first-time buyers is also increasing, but at a decreasing rate. So it suggests that there's actually a slowdown in the housing market. So going back to it, I'm just a bit concerned that actually there may be unintended consequences. And whether the the lack of first-time buyers is actually due to supply-side issues, rather, but it might also be due to demand-side issues. Going back to just the general nature of the economy and, and employment. Revenue Scotland is currently preparing guidance to help taxpayers and their agents understand the, the supplement. And with respect to the implementation of the supplement, it's about the concerns, like what uh, 
Gavin Brown has said about the accidental um, second home owners. So I really do think that we, I would urge the Cabinet Secretary about the grace period. When you think about families who, who buy a house and it might take a number of months to actually to renovate it, they would be affected by this supplement. Others, as, as um, Gavin Brown said, about who accidentally own a house because something else has happened in the, in the chain. Or a family who's relocating from England up to Scotland for work purposes and have bought a home in Scotland and are trying to sell their home in England. But then they'll be affected by the the supplement. So I, I would really hope that the Cabinet Secretary, I know you're saying you're going to take evidence over the first six months, um, but I think actually a, a grace period, especially given how quickly this has been implemented, and I welcome your comments today saying it's going to be from the, was it the 28th of January, but, but I, I think it would be yeah, I would really hope that you consider that the grace period a bit further. I think the questions that the Cabinet Secretary ought to address is what will happen if the Conservative Government of Westminster actually decides to delay the implementation of this tax? And how confident is the Cabinet Secretary that this 3% supplement will change behaviour, will prevent second home ownership and will prevent the crowding out of first-time buyers? So I look forward to hearing the Cabinet Secretary's comments for these questions. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Brennan. I now call on John Swinney to wind up the debate. Deputy First Minister, until 6.40, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I'm always um, delighted to provide helpful advice to Jackie Bailey, and I'm not sure if she was uh, seeking advice, but she, she did ask me whether there would be a charge applied if one was buying a home overseas. And I, I wasn't sure if Jackie Bailey was perhaps just looking for some advice across the chamber to enable her to undertake her financial planning, perhaps, 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 for, perhaps for her retirement, <laughs> but, uh, which is, of course, a long way off before we get to that. But um, what, um, uh, what, what I can say is that the tax charge is only chargeable if the additional home is in Scotland. But if somebody who lives overseas is buying an additional home in Scotland, the charge would be required to be paid in Scotland and of course they would be required by law to report that through the Revenue Scotland return. So, the, so an, over, an individual who is not resident here normally buying a property here would have to indicate on their return whether they owned another property somewhere else in the world and that would be part of the administration. So, yeah, happy to provide some Jackie further Bailey. advice. Thank you very much. Um, can I ask the Deputy First Minister on that basis, does that mean that an incoming worker who maybe is ordinarily resident somewhere else, but is buying a property in Scotland, would be liable? And does he think that would discourage them from coming to Scotland in the first place? First Minister. If, if they were a homeowner in another country, yes, the, the charge would apply. And, of course, people have to weigh up all of the different issues. I'm, I'm, obviously, there are many, many circumstances we can... Uh, we can apply in this debate in individual circumstances, but um, those, um, those circumstances would apply in, 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 in the scenario that Jackie Bailey raises. Um, a lot of the debate, um, Jackie Bailey, Leslie Brennan, uh, Gavin Brown have all made reference to the, the grace period point, and I, and I want to um, I want to address that uh, in my closing remarks. I am prepared to have further discussions about this point. I, 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 I've weighed up the evidence on this issue and I'm, I'm not satisfied that the provisions of the bill does not provide sufficient flexibility to address this issue. But I am very happy to have further discussions about this point, either in the run-up to stage two or stage three, um, to enable me to further consider some of the issues that are involved. Um, there is, of course, provision uh, within the bill for ministers to bring forward a relief from the supplement of any nature. So we can make provision in due course. It doesn't require ordinarily to be undertaken as part of stage two or stage three. Um, and as I indicated, I, I want to give a period of time for us to monitor this issue up until the 30th of October. And that will give us a better impression of the issues that are involved at that stage. The Jackie Bailey raised the issue of the question of a delay to the UK legislation. I have no 
information about that point, but I certainly have no intention of delaying the legislation within Scotland. Um, we have taken this decision because, prompted by the decision of the United Kingdom Government, because I could foresee some market distortion that could take place as a consequence. But now that we have established the, uh, the approach, we, um, it, it, it supports our policy approach in this respect that we wish to protect the opportunities for individuals to gain access to the property market. And I think it's important that that is reflected in the, uh, in the bill. The, one of the other issues that came up in the debate, it was raised by the convener of the Finance Committee and also by Mark Macdonald, and it relates to some of the arrangements that we will increasingly have to consider, and of course we will have to increasingly consider them ever more, now that it is clear that we are going to have the powers envisaged under the Smith Commission and the associated tax powers that will come from that, that we have to consider in our own budgeting and financial process how we undertake the, any changes, timious changes to our legislation to ensure that we have appropriate tax arrangements in place. Um, I can't pretend that it is um, ideal that we've undertaken these changes in such a short time scale, uh, but we have given them a lot of thought and I am committed in the course of stage two and stage three to further consideration on the points of detail to ensure that we cover any of the circumstances and scenarios that may arise that um, require us to make any further provision to, these, uh, to, to this legislation. Um, but I am confident that uh, the Government has um, listened carefully to the feedback of stakeholders to ensure that we are properly prepared and equipped to address any further issues. But I do think it would be helpful for uh, the Government and the incoming Government after the election in May to have the benefit of some reflections from the Finance Committee on what the processes and procedures of Parliament may be like to ensure that we can undertake uh, this type of uh, process of scrutiny in as effective a way as we possibly can do. Um, Mark Macdonald also talked about the, the wider questions of reliefs that would be envisaged under this legislation. Uh, I have set out some of my thinking and I will, um, I'm committed to reflecting further on that as the Bill takes its course through Parliament. Uh, Jackie Bailey also raised uh, a number of points and scenarios about the, uh, of, of detail and about the complexity of the legislation. Um, I accept the fact that there, um, that there is complexity in this legislation, but I think it's incumbent on the approach uh, of the Government to make sure that we explore as many of these scenarios as we can, and I'm satisfied that we have the process in place to enable that to be the case. Finally, presiding officer, uh, mention was made during the debate about the revenue estimates that the government has made. Uh, we have essentially headline estimates of between 45 and 70 million pounds of expected revenue from this supplement. Um, I have settled on uh, a, a, a scenario of 23 million pounds, which is a mid-range estimate which takes into account the effects of forestalling and also uh, the effects of behavioural changes as a consequence. I believe it is a prudent assessment for the Government to have made and one that is relevant to the budget process that we have set out. So I'm, uh, I, I'm, I reaffirm to Parliament the willingness of the Government to engage in detailed scrutiny on these questions and to ensure that the issues raised with us by stakeholders are fully and adequately addressed as we take the Bill through its remaining stages. Thank you, Deputy First Minister. That concludes the debate on Stage 1 of the Land and Buildings Transaction Tax Amendment Scotland Bill. We now move to the next item of business, which is consideration of motion number 15563 in the name of John Swinney on the financial resolution for the Land and Buildings Transaction Tax Amendment Scotland Bill. And I call on John Swinney to move the motion. It moved, President. The question is, motion will be put at decision time, to which we now come. There are seven questions to be put as a result of today's business. The first question is amendment num sorry, the first question is at motion number 15645 in the name of Christine Graham on Scotland's National Action Plan for Human Rights be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The motion is therefore agreed to. The next question is at amendment number 15695.3 in the name of Claire Baker, which seeks to amend motion number 15695 
In the name of Fiona Hislop, on the BBC Charter Renewal process be agreed to? Are we all agreed? Yes. The amendment is therefore agreed to. The next question is amendment number 15695.1 in the name of Liz Smith, which seeks to amend motion number 15695 in the name of Fiona Hislop. On the BBC Charter Renewal process be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The amendment is therefore agreed to. The next question is amendment number 15695.2 in the name of Liam MacArthur, which seeks to amend motion number 15695 in the name of Fiona Hislop on the BBC Charter Renewal process be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament is not agreed. We move to vote. Members should cast the votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 15695.2 in the name of Liam MacArthur is as follows. Yes, 34, no 65. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. The next question is at motion number 15695 in the name of Fiona Hislop as amended. On the BBC Charter renewal process be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed to. The next question is at motion number 15694 in the name of John Swinney. On the Land and Buildings Transaction Tax Amendment Scotland Bill be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed to. The next question is at motion number 15563 in the name of John Swinney on the financial resolution for the Land and Buildings Transaction Tax Amendment Scotland Bill be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed to. That concludes decision time. We are now moving to members' business. Members to leave the chamber should do so quickly and quietly.